live stream. Awesome. Well, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for your patience. I know here in New York, uh, it is wet, cold, and rainy, <laughs> um, which is somewhat unseasonable, but with, I guess, global warming, there are probably more of this coming. But um, thank you so much for making it out. For those of you who are joining us live uh, via YouTube, thank you so much for your patience. Fortunately, we had some technical difficulties. Um, technology will never work nearly as fast as a human brain, so we try and remain as patient as possible. Um, well, welcome. Um, I am Jeremiah Ojo. Um, I am the uh, exhibition organizer, um, and I'm here with Alexis McGrigg. Hi, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, awesome. Um, wanna give special thanks and a shout out, obviously, to our wonderful host, Mr. Richard Beavers himself. Hello, Richard. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks so much, everyone, for uh, joining us for this artist talk. Uh, so uh, for those of you who are joining live uh, via YouTube, uh, feel free to drop your comments um, in, or questions and comments that you may have in the chat uh, during the live stream, and we will be glad to answer that a little bit later. Uh, so shall we begin? Yes. Let's do it. Yeah? Yeah. Awesome, awesome. <laughs> all right, well, um, we're all here because of you, of course. And um, uh, your wonderful solo exhibition, your first solo exhibition yes. here. Right? Yes. Right? Uh, the Ether, Journey in Between. Um, and uh, the exhibition opened on May... 8th. May 8th, yes. that's right. May 8th. Wow. And uh, we're proud to say it's actually been a sold out exhibition. Round of applause for that, right? <laughs> uh, so to give a little bit more context, I'm gonna read Alexis' bio, just so you know, you know, we're in the presence of royalty. <laughs> oh, I'm flattered, thank you. All right. <laughs> awesome, awesome. All right, so Alexis McGrigg is a contemporary artist who explores themes of blackness, space, spirituality, identity, and collective consciousness. Her work utilizes the mediums of painting, drawing, transmedia, and installation to create fictional and philosophical narratives of black existence that stem from historical and lived experiences. She integrates poetry, sound, performance, and performance in her practice as major contributions, uh, contrib contributors, excuse me, of influence throughout her research. Her work is included in several private collections around the world and has been featured in exhibitions across the US, in New York, here, uh, New Orleans, LA, Chicago, uh, Las Vegas, and Oakland. Uh, most recently, um, she was in a group exhibition, uh, Say It Loud, at Christie's Auction House last summer. Um, and then also uh, Seeing 2020 at the Lauren Rogers uh, Museum. Uh, in Mississippi, and then uh, also a group exhibition that she was featured in here uh, that ended actually at the top of the year, Well Surrounds Me, God, Gold, and Kinfolk, uh, here at the gallery. And uh, also most recently, uh, you had some light and installation work featured at the uh, Zhang Institute for Contemporary Art in South Korea. Yes. Did I pronounce that right? Yes, I think so. Okay, <laughs> Zhang, okay. I think it's Zhang, yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. And then uh, lastly, uh, she's earned her Bachelor's of Fine Art in Painting from Mississippi State University in 2012 and a Master's of Fine Art with a concentration in Painting and Transmedia from Texas Tech University in 2017. So let's give another round of applause for Alexis McGill. Thank you. Awesome, awesome. Well, uh, here at Richard Beaver's Gallery, normally we, we call our artist talks Conversations in the Gallery. Um, and this is the, the fourth conversation in the gallery we've actually had this year, even though, uh, you know, quarantine and, and lockdown has kind of uh, plagued a lot of our interactions. So we're excited to have you all here live. Um, we want this to be interactive. So um, towards the end, we really want you to uh, engage with us with your questions. Um, so thank you so much again for being here. Um, one of the things we like to do somewhat non-traditionally are uh, firing off these uh, kind of get to know questions. 
Uh, so are you ready? You're in the hot seat. I'm ready. I'm ready. You're ready? I'm ready. Spotlight's ready. on. Spotlight's on. Awesome. <laughs> All right. So Alexis, what is your favorite color? Purple. Any kind of purple? You're an artist. It's not Lavender. Just Lavender. Lavender. Awesome. Okay. Wonderful. <laughs> um, what have you enjoyed most about New York? Mm, what have I enjoyed most? There's such a huge Rapid variety. Rapid. First thing. Oh, variety. Okay. <laughs> variety. Variety. All right. <laughs> and specifically, Brooklyn. Brooklyn, the food, the, the people. Food. Okay. Mm -hmm. Any particular spot you've enjoyed the most? I really love Zaka Cafe. Zaka Cafe. Shout out to Zaka. Specifically the mustard fried chicken. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. Y'all check it out. They're wonderful people over there. Um, and then uh, this may be a tough one. And we could circle back if need be. Okay. But what is your favorite piece in the exhibition? My favorite piece is this one right behind us. You cannot see on the viewers cannot see, but it's right behind us here. Um, mainly because of the, the palette similar to all of them, but there's something really special happening in the, the colors. There's a really subtle softness. Um, and and that, that piece is called Quiet Resistance, is that correct? Yes. Okay. So for those of you online, feel free to head to our Instagram pages and check out that specific piece. Uh, it's called Quiet Resistance is her particular favorite. Um, well, wonderful. You did well on that. <gasps> A little slow on the second question, but we'll give you grace. <laughs> All right, so you're from Jackson, Mississippi, originally, and that's where you currently live and work, right? I'm from Utica, Mississippi. You're from Utica, mm -hmm. okay. But I'm based in Jackson. Awesome, I'm Jackson. awesome. So being from, uh, I guess, us New Yorkers, we'll call it, I claim myself to be a New Yorker now, even though <laughs> so many people don't agree. But yeah. I've been here two years, yeah. you know, and I pay taxes, so it works out. <laughs> uh, but being from uh, Utica, Mississippi, what may, many may call the rural South, mm -hmm. um, how has that informed your practice as a, as a painter working across media? I think being from the rural South and specifically from that area, from Utica, Mississippi, has made me more aware of my blackness, mm. if that makes sense. And I think it's, it had a lot to do with my surroundings, the, the population specifically okay. of that area. I mean, the town of Utica is probably about 85% African American. Um, and that's me coming from Omaha, Nebraska, which was a predominantly white um, city, white, Asian, and actually Mexican, a large Mexican population. Yeah. And so being there, I mean, I think being in Omaha, I think I wasn't as maybe aware that I was black and there's this other, there's these other demographics happening, but coming yeah. there and being surrounded by black people, people that look like me all the time, every day made me more aware of it. Um, and so I think that influences my thinking about myself and my body and how I walk, how I exist. Yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, blackness is a reoccurring theme within your work and um, kind of charting back to um, not just what we see in this exhibition, but your overall kind of um, uh, ideas of blackness and how you're exploring them. Um, has that been uh, predicated on you living in these different sp spaces where there's a lot of black people to little to no black people? Or how would you categorize your idea of blackness and how you you've been exploring it? I don't think that it's predicated on that experience, those experiences of being surrounded um, mm -hmm. by black people, but I think it made me, it increased my awareness to make me like pay more attention to what's happening around me and pay yeah. more attention to what's going on with me. Um, and so, you know, just kind of observing myself and observing black people as a whole, as a collective unit, how we think, how we move, how we breathe, um, yeah, I think it was more about awareness. Awesome, awesome. And um, yeah, when, when I think about, uh, Alexis and I have known each other for how long now? Seven years. Seven years, <laughs> yeah. Uh, we've worked together in, in a couple of different iterations, uh, believe it or not. We were uh, both directors at the same gallery some, mm -hmm. some years ago. Um, so we've had a, a chance to grow our, our, our friendship, but also a professional relationship as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, like any good person, wherever you go, you bring your tribe. 
you know? <laughs> and um, uh, what's been great, I know uh, last year, uh, you started kind of getting back to uh, creating work. Because yes. for a period of time, you were kind yes. of out of the mix. Can you tell us a little bit about that kind of transition? Yes, so, uh, you know, I was in grad school and coming out of grad school, all of, all of us as artists are trying to figure out what is our next step, what direction are we going? And then there's there's that, and you want you want to continue being artists. You have all these ideas. You have this this motivation. You have this um, engine behind you that's sort of pushing you forward. Mm -hmm. um, and then you have this battle of oh, but I must live too. <laughs> um, and so I think that's what I personally went through, trying to figure out the best way for me to continue my studio practice and focus and develop that, but also trying to just live. Yeah. Um, so that was something I sort of struggled with, but I always still had this part of me. I still had to keep making. Mm -hmm. um, and so it was like I took, I took a hiatus, I guess you could say, from painting until there was an opportunity that had come up um, with the Mississippi Museum of Art. Um, yeah. And they were asking me if I could just basically film myself in my studio practice so they could you know, have a discussion about it. So I made these two paintings and I remembered, okay, this is what I do. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and it's, it's, it's kind of like taking away from my existence to not be doing that. Yeah. And so it was kind of like this spark, you need to begin again and don't stop, yeah. keep going. And, and with that, um, you know, I've, I've worked with many artists, particularly black artists throughout the diaspora and on the continent. And it's oftentimes when an opportunity is given is really the fire under your feet. Yeah. Do you, dare I say, regret not continuing your practice? Or how, how do you view that kind of uh, hiatus space in so, reflecting back? Yeah, so I, I actually just spoke with someone about this the other day that um, you really, coming out of grad school, you really, I didn't realize the importance of continuing making the work. Mm -hmm. Like you have these bodies of work that you made while you're studying and you're holding on to that as you leave. Yeah. But it's so, so important to keep the fire, keep, sure. keep working through whatever it is, the ideas, you have to keep moving forward no matter what the, the transition of your life is taking. Yeah. Because, I hate to say it, no one's worried about the work that you made. <laughs> They're worried about the work that you're making. Right. And your ideas have to continue developing if you're not working through, if you're not actually having your having hands on experience in your practice then your conceptual ideas become stagnant your methods become stagnant yeah. all the kind of light bulbs that you have as you're working you miss those light bulbs you miss those moments that yeah. you know there might be a breakthrough you might mess up something or 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 have what you might call an accident but that accident could tell you the next thing that you need to say in your work yeah so it's so important to keep going and I regret that I didn't. Yeah. I regret that I kind of like paused um, because I felt like my ideas paused. Yeah. And I feel like I could, I could be so much further than I was. Yeah, and, it, and it's interesting because you know, so many creative professionals, regardless of discipline, not just you know, uh, visual artists, struggle with that. You know, particularly the ones that are professionally trained or go to school for it, they're like, what's next? And I think, in, in reflecting in the, the broader obstacle many people just face, especially now in just finding jobs after school. We know kind of how the economy and um, things have been going, particularly with quarantine. You know, what are the things that you can incite for yourself? And I think something that was really great with you is, you know, you're in Mississippi. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not necessarily an art capital, right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> so to find an opportunity to do something like in your home, you know, city, so to speak, um, really sparked some additional thought, but also made reference to, because I also want to kind of build um, into the narrative around this exhibition mm -hmm. of work you were doing in grad school mm -hmm. and how you were able to kind of build another layer on those concepts. Yeah. So can you talk a little bit about some of the work that you did in grad school and how really this series of work, the ether, is kind of an amalgamation of all of those, uh, I guess, explorations of blackness. Yes. So in this this specific body of work, I feel like is a 
collective of all of the all of the bodies of work that I made while in grad school. I feel like it holds something, a, a small piece from each series. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm gonna go way back. <laughs> well, way back. Way back, but it's back. <laughs> back to 2015 when I first kind of developed this idea or the, the, the word blackness became very um, apparent to me that I was gonna be thinking about this for many years to come. Um, so in the beginning of this, I started talking about this idea of blackness, working, thinking about it as sort of like a larger cylindrical space. But even before that, I'll go back. Even before that, I had started thinking about ancestral lineage and you know what is my connection to continental Africa. But it got to a point where I felt that the work did not require the figure anymore. So my work right now, it has these sort of ambiguous figures, but going back, I'm just explaining to you guys, my work was figurative before it became this. Um, so in those very early stages, I was thinking a lot about layers, like physical layers on the paper and creating layers, like thinking of the, the, the painting as a opening, as an opening to an alternate space. Thinking about my ancestors living in this alternate space, space that I could see through the picture plane. Um, and so then as I continue to develop or think about those ideas of an alternate space, I, that's when I came across this idea of thinking about blackness, thinking about it as a, a void, an opening, an opening in the plane, or thinking about it as fi finding its foundation in our physical body, and then also thinking about it as this sort of bigger, bigger intangible idea that we don't really fully have an understanding of how um, vast or broad it is and what it was made up of. Yeah. And so in the very beginning, I was thinking about it being made up of all the maybe psychological trauma and the things that we carry as black people navigating how, how we live. Um, and as I continue, the, the mediums that I was using then were, uh, I started with charcoal and then worked my way into charcoal and using acrylics and right. layering in that way. Um, and as I continued working with the idea, the mediums had to change. Yeah. The palettes had the palette had to change. So I went from making these um, sort of figures emerging from basically a space that I had created with layers and layers of charcoal, yeah. and using acrylic and pulling figures out from that. And then I moved into um, doing charcoal only with. Um, some textual writing and making figures using that. And then I moved from- And actually, can you talk a little bit about that? Because that's something that's uh, very interesting, particularly in contemporary practice. You find a lot of uh, visual artists using text um, within their work. But from what I understand and know about you and your practice, you've, you've incorporated into the actual paintings themselves. But in this mm -hmm. iteration, You've, you've used it in order to create the work. Can you talk a little bit and kind of give us a preview of what that looks like you know, prior to what we see now in this exhibition? Yes, so it became where I was, so part of a large part of my studio practice deals with um, reading and, and writing myself. I do what's called free writing. Um, and so I would do these, I would have these words or phrases and I would start making um, figures out of the text out of the writing that I had, you know, written on, on a painting or in my sketchbook or, um, and starting to make figures in that way. But I had these two things happening. I was making space using writing. I was making space using charcoal. I was making space by, I mean, I was identifying figures in the space. So yeah. it started to be like a, an amalgamation of those three things working together. Um, and then, so I moved from that then to thinking about just the actual not, not removing the figure in yeah. some way um, and just thinking about the plane itself. What does it look like? Um, w w how, how far does it go into the plane? Mm -hmm. um, is there a temperature? Is there a texture? Yeah. Um, and so I kind of started thinking about myself in it, in this opening. Yeah. And if I were to exist in this opening, what does that look like? And how can I help 
people see that visually, what I'm trying to explain. So then it became, I was making these sort of, um, I guess, journeys. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> at that time, but just thinking about the, the plane itself, not even considering the figures. So, um, so uh, with that, um, if you'll excuse me for a second, mm -hmm. you said something that I think is really interesting. And even in our discussion in organizing this exhibition, how do you invite an audience or viewers who hear words like celestial and conceptual and they're like, what? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, what has been your journey even in inviting an audience to understand uh, what this work represents without it being like overt? Because, you know, the idea of, of, of when you say blackness, it means something to everyone because we all have our own ideas of blackness as black people and then non-black people obviously have their own perception based on what they've um, been enculturated or uh, been exposed to. So for yourself, what has been the interaction of people either, you know, where you're from, who've come to your studio, to here in the exhibition, and learning about your work and not maybe understanding the broader ideas that you've come from. How do they enter the work or how do they perceive it without having any like concept of what I'm, what I'm saying? Yeah, and, and how much, I guess, of a responsibility do you feel you have to in inviting people in a certain way or like? So, I think for, especially for the works that are similar to these that have the kind of like ambiguous figures, um, I think people approach it and they have this identification that immediately it's, it's a soul or it's some sort of like being. Mm -hmm. They may not necessarily attach it to blackness, mm -hmm. but they have some sort of like receptiveness about life being there life or light or some sort of um, alternate alternate existence. Yeah. Um, and then I think after they then go read and then they have this relation to blackness, then they you know kind of connect the dots. Yeah. But I think that people access it because all of us are these kind of vessels carrying, we're, we're, we're souls in these vessels. And so I think it, it, it resonates with everyone in some way, or at mm -hmm. least they identify it in some way. Yeah, um, yeah. No, that's, that's really great. And um, it actually reminds me of um, a reference that was brought up, I guess, during the opening mm -hmm. about um, someone who made reference to seeing these figures or a form mm -hmm. that represented something in space. Can you talk a little bit about that? So specifically about this piece to our right? Is that what you're talking about? Uh, yeah. A covering for the soul, yeah. just for you guys watching. Yeah, this long <laughs> this um, there's a piece in this series called A Covering for the Soul that um, a person visiting the exhibition said, oh, well, have you seen these images? They're, they're called the, they're from the NASA, NASA Hubble telescope. Yeah, they're pictures the NASA of the Hubble galaxy. telescope. They take these, you know, beautiful pictures out in the furthest depths of space. But he specifically referenced there's these images of what are called the pillars of creation. And when he saw my painting, he said, "Those look exactly like the pillars of creation." And I said, "What? what you know, what? What is that? <laughs> what are those?" So he showed me a picture. <laughs> He showed me a picture of the pillars of creation and I said, oh, I've seen these pictures before. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I thought they were photoshopped. I thought I didn't know they were actual formations in yeah. space. And so he said, you've never, you didn't know these were real things. So it was like, I'm creating this work that looks like these formations in outer space that I didn't know were real. Mm -hmm. And I mean, the similarity is, uncanny it's 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 it it took me back like yeah <laughs> wait uh hold on <laughs> um I, I just thought it was amazing right. um yeah and it made me start thinking about you know collective consciousness and all this but yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and i think that's that's a, a a wonderful way of of seeing it is like there are so many different entry points you talk about planes right mm -hmm. and all these different levels um that you create with media and that you're thinking about this conceptually, but there's also, you know, paths that people approach the work, mm -hmm. you know? Um, I think for many people who see the work, 
there's there's a glow, there's like this halo, there's this light. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in understanding you developing the narrative around this work, the ether, you know, and even the title Journey in Between, it's the light in between, you know. Um, can you talk a little bit about particularly the process of kind of using certain materials to, to give that luminance and that, that yellow glow? Well, it's not necessarily that I'm creating a yellow glow. It's yeah. more that um, when, I, when I start painting, I, I'm, I'm not necessarily thinking about a, a specific figure or a specific um, glow that's even gonna come from each of them because I approach all of them, I treat the medium, I use Procyon dyes, I treat the medium more like watercolor than mm -hmm. um, you know, like a thicker based paint. Um, but I'm usually layering from light to dark. So I really just begin thinking about, oh, I think I'm gonna go with a yellow, like we have yellow in these, or I think I'm mm -hmm. gonna start with a, a peach, or I think I'm gonna start with a very, very light blue. Um, and so then I will go around and I'll layer the first layer and I'll put them down, but always working in a circle on the yeah. floor. So all of my works begin on the floor for those of you who are listening. Um, but I will take the, the um, water-based media and I'll just pour around in a circle, just kind of constantly. I feel like I'm dancing around <laughs> of it when I'm working. I feel like I'm kind of like dancing around, but I'm, it, it's very methodical, I guess, because I'm making these circles, but yeah. I'm not controlling how the water is moving on the paper. Mm -hmm. And so I just continue working with whatever colors I feel should come next. Um, but still thinking about light to dark, that's the technical part of it. Yeah. But as I pour the, the, the various colors on there, they start to make these different shapes. Yeah. And as they make the shapes, I allow the, the shape that it's making to guide me on mm. what color to do next, because sometimes the, you know, the colors, they interact, they kind of mix together. They might yeah. make, you know, if I've got yellow and I've got red, now I've got red orange, and do I want to put blue? No, I'm probably going to go with magenta or mm -hmm. you know thinking about it like that but um allowing the 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 water to move as it needs to move on the surface mm -hmm. and following the water yeah um and so i'll just keep layering keep layering with some thinking technically about sure. how the shape is going to form i'm looking at what's happening i'm looking at the shape that it's making and in some ways controlling trying to control yeah. but not really being in control. Um, yeah. So making a circle or thinking about a head figure and shoulders and body yeah. um, and working around it in that way. But in it, it, it still does, it still moves how it Yeah, how it's, it it's wants water. To move. It's water. <laughs> and, and water, yeah. you know, does what it wants to do, yeah. you know. Um, um, and that's really interesting. I mean, uh, a lot of painters tend to be intuitive. You know, they respond to the colors of, particularly, um, you know, thinking color theory and other things to, to make sure that it looks a certain way, mm -hmm. but with water and it's pooling and then also drying, I'm sure you get a different effect within hues. Yes, definitely. Um, when layering the, the, the dye, it looks like it's going to be like a deep, rich color, but you, you're really not sure, or I'm really not sure. It's kind of like playing roulette. <laughs> I'm really not sure if it's going to maintain that richness and it sure. also has to do with the amount of pigment pigment putting, you know, that I'm putting in the water. So in the beginning stages I yeah. start with just smaller amounts, but as I start approaching the end, I start putting much more um, dye into the water. Um, and then also as I'm kind of moving through those layers, I start forcing the shape. Yeah. Maybe forcing isn't the right word. Definitely. I start forming the shape more mm -hmm. or um, using less water as I pour onto the surface yeah. and moving the water. Got you. Yeah. So, oh. you know, the more water I use, the less control. Yeah. The less water I use, the more control I have on the shape that it's starting to take or to try to like finesse it into the shape that it's already making. Yeah, yeah. No, that's, that's a really beautiful process. It also makes me think um, about the contrast between works on paper and canvas. So mm -hmm. where we're sitting here 
Um, I think you all can see online, we're sitting in between Tempestuous Twins 1 and 2. Yes. And then um, No Beauty to Bear here yes. in the center. Yes. Uh, can you talk about either the challenges or how you were guided by certain uh, kind of the call and response of materials and mm -hmm. how they're setting or not setting or drying mm -hmm. between canvas and paper? So the, the two materials, paper and canvas, are, are obviously because of what they're made of are much different, but the, the paper seems to me, in my personal opinion, is way more absorptive, if that's a word. It <laughs> absorbs more yeah. than um, canvas, which is confusing because canvas is cloth. Yeah. It, it has fiber and it should be able to receive the dye that I'm applying, but canvas in some ways repels the dye. So I really have to kind of like work it into the surface. Yeah. Um, and I have to, I have to spend much more time in the application in the way that I'm applying it than I have to tend to the paper, right? The yeah. paper kind of takes the water and lets it soak in yeah. the canvas. I must physically work it yeah. into, you know, with my brushes and, you know, walking around with my hands and rub rub the surface in order for it to receive it. Yeah. Um, and there were, there are a lot of challenges with canvas and, and maintaining this sort of consistency of mark making uh, between canvas yeah. and paper. But as I was telling, I was telling one of our guests today, um, they both have sort of a very, have unique qualities about the mark making that's yeah. made. And particularly, uh, there's two there's two different kinds of canvases you guys probably don't know that there's two different kinds of canvases that are in this exhibition and both even those two different types of canvas mm -hmm. take mark making very differently for example a covering for the sole the lines the edges um, that kind of canvas allows it to kind of uh, gently spread mm -hmm. instead of it kind of like the dye sitting, sitting. on the surface oh, okay. right so that's what happens with thi this is just kind of regular duck canvas, right? And it sits on the surface. So if you look at this piece here specifically, you see these kind of like, um, you can see the edge of the droplet, right? Yeah. And that's how it is when I apply it. If I drop the water on there and I let it stay in a puddle, I let it stay in a right. pool because if I move it, now I'm getting this, mm. right? If I add more water, now I'm getting these soft, edges and things like this, but in order for it to maintain this kind of like rigid textural, I must let the water sit and absorb as it's going to without manipulating it. Wow, wow, so much more labor in the canvas work for sure. Much more labor in the canvas works. Yeah. The, the, the paper works require labor, but they don't require the physical okay. effort, yeah. right? I can lightly ap apply the, the die to paper and let them sit and you know let them rest they're much yeah. more delicate yeah the canvas works are much more I would say vigorous in the application process yeah that's very interesting and it also makes me think of uh, again your kind of conceptual idea that you're building from this idea of blackness right that you know we all have heard blackness isn't a monolith in looking at the colors and how they're received, it makes me think of like blackness and skin tone and the vastness that you find within um, not just our skin tone, but experiences, right? You know, I'm Nigerian American, um, was born and raised in the American South, and I have more in common with you being from Mississippi than I do with someone in Nigeria, but there's still that connection, right? Where all of these are paintings, some are on paper, some are on canvas, some of the hues and dyes are similar, but not quite the same. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what's really interesting when you look at you know, uh, artwork as metaphors for you know, it, art imitates life. Like how can you see these different temperatures of black, mm -hmm. blue, violet, and the like? Because they're all kind of similar. And even yeah. if you just remove some of the light that's hitting it, you know, one may even say that you know, uh, certain paintings tones are the same, mm -hmm. but it just depends on how you look at it. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really interesting to unpack, you know, the visual and the conceptual around blackness as a body of work when you've worked within two separate media of, I guess, paper and, uh, and canvas. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Um, 
And that leads me to actually a really interesting question. Um, you have some really cool titles for these works. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> can, can you um, talk to us a little bit about some of the titles of, of the work and what they mean to you? Yes. Um, so I'll, I'll go with untraversable. Um, several of the titles have an un at the beginning mm -hmm. of the word. Um, and I think that is in part because of in my thinking about this idea of the ether and how these forms kind of like manifest in that space. Part of that manifestation is the ability for these forms to come into existence without any sort of restraint. Mm -hmm. So it's unbound. Um, it is not confined by any sort of um, predisposed idea of what it must look like or how it must take shape. Um, or like specifically untraversable, it, it is not easy to overcome or conquer or travel across or move or have it be moved, yeah. right? Um, all of the figures, I think of them as these sort of defiant um, beings that however they come into being is um, it's raw and it's visceral and it is like breaking breaking out of like it being uh, having bound what do you call this a straight jacket like, you oh, know, the, yeah. the straps straps yeah the, but it bursting being, through bursting through it's yeah. like escaping what is trying to hold it down yeah um so any ideas of what it has to be it does not have to be beautiful mm -hmm. how it how it flourishes into the space or how it opens into the space does not have to be gentle, it does not have to be mm. delicate, it does not have to be refined. So it is the opposite of what people try to put on it. So it put on the idea of blackness by it, I'm talking about blackness. Yeah. So it coming into this space has the freedom to be how it, however it needs to be. Right. So I think that's where I'm, I kind of like play with the un, portion of some of the titles yeah um but for me some of the titles are in relation to that yeah. in opposition or without bound yeah and it's as i'm listening to you explain that and looking at some of these works um particularly this one the multitude where it has multiple kind of figures in a group almost a family mm -hmm. um together these kind of golden yellow drips it's almost like bursting through something and there's residue of this travel or this journey. Like I've, I've been through some things, you mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> you know, old folks, <laughs> yeah. grandma say, I've, I've seen life, baby, you know? Yeah. <laughs> right? Like there are drips of memories, wisdom, like all these things that have kind of packed and weighed you down. Yeah. But you've emerged and you're still here. Right. So it, you know, this is no beauty to bear. We have quiet resistance here. I don't have to bear any beauty. Mm. I don't have to carry. Ain't that a weight. word? <laughs> <laughs> I don't have to carry it. So, yeah. yeah. That's really wonderful. That's really wonderful. Um, well, uh, I think now is a good time to perhaps open it up to the audience and uh, see if you all have any additional questions. I mean, we could talk forever. <laughs> um, any uh, questions here? Any thoughts or reflections on the works? Um, thank you so much. Your ex exhibition is beautiful. Thank you. You talked about your process in regards to working on paper and two types of canvas. Mm -hmm. Do you have a preference? So initially, my preference was paper. But as I started developing these works on canvas, I think I've been drawn in more to the works on canvas because I feel like there's much more depth that can be created. There is depth in the paper works, but I feel like because of the resistance of the material itself and its relation to the content, <laughs> um, I feel like I'm probably going to be leaning into the works on canvas a lot more because I feel like I can continue really building on that, building on the application, building on the idea as well. Um, 
I was particularly interested in your thought process while you're in the motion of creating these pieces. Mm -hmm. Like, were you particularly um, thinking of anyone um, you're personally close to, or were you just thinking of black hum community in, in, in general? Sometimes I'm thinking of someone specific, like for example, um, this piece, Brother in the E, um, I was thinking about my actual brother. Um, the, the, shape, the shape of that figure, as I, as I was working and I started to see that head figure, I saw my brother. Um, but sometimes I'm thinking about my family or sometimes I'm thinking about the broad collective of black people. Um, so I think sometimes I will see someone that I know in the figure that appears, but sometimes they're just kind of like broad figures. Mm-hmm. Other questions? Yes. Do you mind? Um, so along with that, when you're processed, like, do you wake up in the morning? Are you at night? Is it, um, do you have like, you know, some artists have a specific routine to get into their flow, as people would say. Is there something that you do or it's just kind of random and spontaneous? Um, it, de it depends on the time of day. Um, so in the morning, I will tend to come into the studio early in the morning, about 5.30, and I'll just kind of, I'll look at the application from the previous evening. And either I will, it, and, and it also depends on what stage I'm in in the, pa in the painting and drying process. So if I'm toward the end, I'll spend a lot of time just kind of like looking and observing to try to figure out, okay, what, what, met, what uh, layer needs to happen next? Or if I'm approaching the very end, or if there's just one more layer that's happening. Um, but I spend a lot of time looking and watching, especially towards the end. Um, but uh, in the evening time, I will kind of come in, I will look and kind of sit with the works for a, for a period of time, and then I will decide what palette I'm going with, you know, what, what, what colors I'm going to work with. Um, and then I'll just begin working. I'll just start moving, just start painting. So I meant more like, do you put some music on? Do you have oh, a mood? Oh, do you oh. have, do you so, like have So, okay, a okay. <laughs> yeah, um, so I don't listen to any music um, when I'm working. Um, part of my habit in coming into the studio, I'll come in and I'll sweep. <laughs> um, I think it has something to do with me thinking about the kind of like material buildup or um, any kind of like debris that is just collected on the surface. Um, I'll sweep and then I'll sit. I don't listen to any music. I might read. I'll bring a book, and I'll sit there, and I'll read a little bit, and then I will watch. I know it sounds very boring, <laughs> but, but that's a part of it. Um, and sometimes I don't even work. I don't even paint. I just look at them. Um, and that's sort of like my thing. I, I sweep, watch, work or sweep, watch, read, then work. I think it's beautiful that you say sweep. I've never heard someone say that, because as you said it, and the type of work that you're doing, I think my, my family's from the South. Um, my grandfather used to sweep, and when he had Alzheimer's, he would sweep. That was his thing. And yeah. So when you say that, you know, it, it makes me think of like, you're almost staging your space, you know, clearing out mm -hmm. space for something new to come in, so it's yeah. really beautiful. Yeah, and I think it's like the, you know, when you're washing dishes, you're, you know, you're, you're, in yeah. you're thinking about something. Yeah. And so you're kind of, you're doing an action, mm -hmm. but your brain is turning about whatever the content is. Yeah, it's meditative. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, a question here from uh, Dare or Dare, I'm, <laughs> I'm thinking, uh, Coulter, even though there was paint in some of your earlier charcoal works, these pieces feel 
uh, different because they utilize color in much more dominant way. Do you find your creative process different in color versus black and white? The creative process is definitely um, different. I mean, the, the application using this variety of color, the, the method of application is completely different. When I was working with charcoal, um, I would begin just by creating a surface of acrylic. While this is raw, you know, I'm just working on the raw surface. But with when I was just doing charcoal, do, doing the layers of acrylic, I was like, but, well, I guess the vigorous motion of applying the charcoal, that, that might be the same as how I'm applying the um, dye here. Um, but the, me the methods, I think, are different simply because the material requires it to be different. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Awesome. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Um, I'm sorry. I can talk about you. I'm not trying to just speak. <laughs> Got you. Um, you mentioned, like, as an artist, people aren't really concerned about what you've done. They're more so concerned about what you're either working on or the future. Still, do you revisit past works or past thought processes or past understandings of blackness in, in your pursuit of the future? Or what role does the past have to play? Um, I think that I do revisit them because that specifically using this medium, it was kind of like a breakthrough in a previous series. So there was a series called um, Space, Periphery, and Ascension that was a collective of the, the souls that I started talking about, um, connecting it to the previous series, talking about blackness, and then um, it was the beginning of me thinking about of a, a, a journey uh, or, you know, figures and space together. So I think I do look back at those works to see um, more how the figures have started to develop, um, how I was approaching creating the figures, what shapes they're making, and then that influencing how I'm gonna think about these forms as I kind of continue to move forward. So I, I feel like I take a piece from each of those as I continue moving forward, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That also brings up another thought. Um, you work across disciplines, right? So yes, we're sitting in front of these beautiful paintings, but uh, I mean, you also have uh, some work on display in China, or rather, South Korea. South Korea, yes. sorry. <laughs> um, that is uh, video and installation work, is that correct? Yes, it, well it's, yes, it's video installation. Can you tell us a little bit more about how your practice extends into, you know, video installation, photography, and others? People may be curious on what that looks like as well. Yes, so part of my practice in working with video, I. I think I call it experimental video because it's sort of a combination of my painting process, a combination of like performance that I'm working in my studio, um, and a combination of manipulation on you know the programming that I use to generate the video. So you know Adobe Premiere or After Effects, um, and taking footage of myself working, taking footage of the paintings, taking footage of, you know, all of the layering, and then putting all of that together and manipulating it to look like, like have a relationship mm -hmm. with the paintings that exist. So I just call them experimental videos, but there is that sort of constant. I also have um, photography that I do digital painting <laughs> with, <laughs> um, but for me, I'm, I'm, I'm continuing this um, idea of making these sort of figures through the different mediums. How can I take these different mediums and make them relate? How can they have a conversation? Yeah, and, and knowing that uh, you, know, you got your master's, your MFA um, in transmedia using mm -hmm. multiple different, was that something that came through your graduate studies or were you always kind of thinking of expanding ideas in different media over time? I think in my graduate studies, um, as I was kind of working through my studio practice, um, as I was kind of working through my studio practice and trying to figure out, you know, what was the, what was the, Im how was the imagery going to continue to change? A lot of my thinking was that the image was moving. Mm -hmm. And so 
is moving, it's not still, I'm doing photography and I'm doing painting and both of those are still, now what do I do? How can I, I need to make something that yeah. is moving. Yeah. So now I need to make video. <laughs> okay, but now I'm making videos that are not having conversation with my paintings. Mm. Now I'm prob problem solving. How do I make them have a conversation? Yeah. And so the movement and the paintings, bega I began to combine them. And so I think it was like a development of me trying to figure out how to, how to combine the mediums, which yeah. then became this sort of product of ambiguous, you know, color field image, moving images and things like that. Yeah. And it also sounds really archival as well, right? Where you're documenting kind of the process and the relationship of, yeah. of different things. Because if you're either repurposing an image or a concept into yeah. a new media, yeah. you know, you're continuing um, that thought, that energy, mm -hmm. that soul, so to speak. Yeah. And manifesting it in a new way. Yeah, and I think even in the, the video work that I was making, it transitioned in the same ways that the images in my work transition. So, you mm. know, earlier on, I was doing very figurative portraits. Yeah. Um, and the videos that I, were, oh, that I, I was making those, were yeah. <laughs> videos of me. <laughs> you yeah. know, videos of a figure dancing, moving, performing. Mm -hmm. um, and as the work started to lose its shape, the figures started to lose shape in my work. Yeah. The image of the videos started to lose its, it didn't, it wasn't required to be a physical identifiable form anymore. Yeah. So. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Um, are there any other questions that we may have here before we close out? Yeah. Top three artists that inspire me to do what I do. I would say, I'm not gonna say visual artists because a large part of what I'm constantly influenced by and I mention it all the time, you probably can pull it up in every video that I've spoken <laughs> about, is dance. Um, T. Lang Dance Company specifically. Yeah. Um, I'm, I, I feel like every time I see the movement of her performances, it sort of sparks a compartment <laughs> in my brain. Yeah. Um, but I'll she say T. Great. Lang, dance company. Yeah. Um, also, I will say, I'm still influenced by Mark Rothko. Maybe it's the, the colors, the palette, I don't, I don't know. Um, I also look at uh, Radcliffe Bailey. He yeah. does sort of like Afrofuturism. Uh, Torquaze Dyson, I love her. She's also, she lives here in New York. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. Great question. Oh, and Sam Gilliam. Sam Gilliam. Can't forget yes. Sam. Sam Gilliam, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> all the time, all day. <laughs> yes, <laughs> definitely Sam Gilliam. <laughs> That's awesome. That's yeah. Awesome. Thank you for your question. Yeah. Uh, any other questions or thoughts before we wrap up here? No? Any online? Oh, okay. Thanks so much, Cole. No okay. All right. All right, we have a question here from Sheer Livia. Um, are any of the pieces for sale or are they on display, <laughs> respectfully? <laughs> they are all for sale, uh, but they are also all sold out. <laughs> Round of applause for that. <laughs> um, but actually, as a great segue, um, even though the works are all sold out, I mean, um, we encourage you to uh, send an email to rb at richardbeaversgallery.com or to DM us on um, the Richard Beavers um, Instagram um, if you have interest in acquiring works um, as they are made available in the future. But um, Alexis also has multiple um, exhibitions and uh, displays of her work coming up, uh, which is really exciting. Um, she'll be participating uh, in a group show that will be here in the gallery that I too will be organizing uh, in September. And then the Untitled Art Fair at Miami Beach um, in December during Art Basel Miami Beach, that first week of December, um, her work will be featured there. Um, but also, and I'm excited to say, next year, April? April. April 2022, a solo exhibition 
with Almy Reich in Paris, in Paris, France. So our girl is international. <laughs> Not just South Korea, Paris. <laughs> Yes. So uh, many great things are on the horizon. Um, it's been a great pleasure to uh, not only work with you, but you're a friend. You know, we've been at this for a while. You know, um, in different arenas. So it's been great to uh, you know kind of come full circle here in New York and be able to collaborate in this way, and work with Richard. You know, Richard is a great dealer uh, friend as well. You know, and has built a really wonderful community that is centered around social change, activism, wealth development and knowledge, like, if you're in bed style, this is where it's at, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so um, thank you, Richard, again, for your continued support and elevation for voices from all over, you know? Um, and this is a great hyperlink to, to global uh, culture, but specifically black culture. So we thank you all here who have braved the rain and, and the cold, oddly cold weather in May. <laughs> And um, thank you all online. Uh, we appreciate your patience in migrating over to YouTube versus Zoom. Yes. And um, yeah, let us know if you have questions. Uh, the exhibition has been extended. Um, initially, it was due to close on the 5th. It'll be open, um, still on view until the 18th. Um, so keep in touch with us uh, on Instagram, at Richard Beavers Gallery. For myself, you can follow me at Ile Kunwa. Um, and then um, Alexis, you're? Yes, you can follow me at Alexis McGrig on Instagram and www.alexismcgrig.com.